into it. Um, if at any point you don't see my slides or hear me, please just shout or somebody send me a, a message if possible. But yeah, um, so as Ketevi already said, and Christine as well, I was part of the ASP 2010. Yeah, I was thinking about it today and it's like over 10 years ago already, that's, that's a lot. Um, but yeah, in this talk, uh, I'll be telling you a bit about myself and my background. And then I'll also be telling you about uh, my research uh, in experimental particle physics, uh, focusing on um, my PhD work. Um, so yeah. So to begin with, um, I was born in Zambia. This is where I, I was raised. So Zambia is um, a beautiful landlocked country that is shown in red on this map. Uh, it's in the southern region of Africa. So this is where I did all my studies up to undergraduate level. And I just want to mention here that um, my father passed away when I was 12. And so from then on, I was raised by uh, a single mom who wasn't working at the time. And so, but she managed like with the help of my grandfather, her father and um, her siblings to, to make sure that my young sister and I had an education. So I thought I should just mention so you can understand like um, when I talk about my career choices in the coming slide. Okay, so this is me um, in first year and an old photo from the University of Zambia in the physics lab. And I chose this picture because I thought that somewhat my face here shows how my life was, like how I felt uh, pursuing a career in physics for, for most of my undergrad life kind of worried about what I was going to do with um, a career in physics. So yeah, I just want to tell you a bit about that. Um, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I, I really enjoyed physics. No, I, like I hated it. it, was one of my favorites. And I really did well in it, but I just never saw myself um, pursuing a career in physics. And in fact, none of my career guidance teachers ever told us about careers in physics. So what I really wanted to do um, when I went to the University of Zambia was something related to medicine. So either pharmacy or biomed or medicine, like anything like that. And one of the reasons for this, um, besides me kind of having a passion for this at the time, was that what had been fading my mind um, is that for me to escape poverty, I had to do something uh, that was branded as a financially rewarding career um, in Zambia. And this was something like medicine uh, or engineering. So, but then what happened was that during the first semester actually of my first year, I felt chemistry. And this was very essential for, for me to follow a career in uh, a medicine related field. So I was really devastated, I was frustrated and I I had a couple of options. I could keep trying uh, to get into medicine. Many people had done that. Um, but then after talking to some friends, um, they advised me um, to do physics because I showed better aptitude for it. So yeah, I, I went into it uh, completely lost and uh, not knowing what I was going to do with a physics degree at, at the end of the day. So. Yeah, that's how most of my undergrad life was, just going to lectures out of duty um, until um, sometime in my final year when I started to engage more with my lecturers. Then I started seeing like my mind opened to how much more you know physics had to offer. And then um, also in my final year, uh, now my, my slides aren't changing. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So um, in my final year, then I went to the African School of Physics in, in Stellenbosch. And here I was just completely blown away. I, I met a lot of people. Um, I was particularly drawn to CERN and, and particle physics, maybe because this is where I heard it for, for the very first time. And I think 
most of the people um, leading the program at that time were, were from were doing something related to CERN or particle physics. Uh, so yeah, I I became amazed and yeah, so I I met a lot of people, some of which I I have come to work with in the years that followed. So you know already uh, people like Ketevi. And so I've worked with Ketevi during my master's and this uh, Dr. Claire Lee uh, behind Christine, who I worked with um, during my PhD. Um, so long story short, um, on slide five, you can see the picture at the top left. This is me graduating happily with a degree in physics. So at this point, I had already applied for uh, a program at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, like a, a diploma in mathematical sciences. And I found out about this place from a friend that I had met uh, at the ASP, during the ASP. So he told me um, he was going to, to the African um, Institute for Mathematical Sciences, told me about the program. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna try and apply. So I applied and I got in. And the picture on the top right, uh, this is me at the, at the far end, at the far right, uh, graduating with this diploma. And you see the former vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, uh, standing with some of my friends there. So this was in 2011. Uh, no, 2012, when I when I graduated from Ames, I finished my physics bachelor's in 2011, then the um, diploma program in 2012. And from there, um, I had done a project during this diploma program uh, in particle physics with one of the lecturers from the University of Cape Town. And so then I continued with him uh, to my master's. Uh, which I finished in 2014. I show this graduation heart uh, here at the bottom left because at this time I, I I graduated in absentia because like my graduation was just I think it was on a Wednesday and my wedding was on a Saturday the the same week so I couldn't go for my graduation. So then um, a year later I continued with my PhD, uh, also at the University of Cape Town, uh, which I just graduated from at uh, December 2020. Also, it was virtual. So I just have a picture of myself saying I did it. I finally managed. So yeah, um, I actually submitted my PhD thesis in uh, at the end of 2019, and I had my results um, by April 2020. So uh, from then on, in July 2020, I was given a postdoc position at the University of Cape Town, where I worked until um, October last year, and then joined the Brookhaven National Laboratory um, in November 2020, and this is where I am currently as a postdoc. Okay, so on this slide, I just want to show you also some of the opportunities that, that I've met, like there's a few among many uh, during this journey. So at the top um, left picture, this is me um, in the Atlas Cavern in 2013. This is like standing next to one of the um, detectors at the Large Hadron Collider, which I'll talk about uh, later in my talk. This was in 2013. I had, gone, I had come to CERN as a summer student, a very exciting program um, that some of you um, uh, young physicists could, could actually apply to. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, and then on the top right uh, picture, I got it, I was being given an award for the Atlas PhD grant. Um, this is a very prestigious um, grant that is given um, by the Atlas experiment for like PhD students to spend some time working from CERN. So I spent two years uh, with this grant based at CERN. And so the picture on the bottom left this is me um, at the far right 
uh, presenting, I was presenting um, a poster on some of my PhD work uh, on some component of the Atlas uh, detector called the, the muon spectrometer. Um, standing at the far left is my PhD advisor, Dr. Sao Yakub from the University of Cape Town. So at this time we were at one of the biggest conferences in high energy physics uh, called ICHEP, International Conference on High Energy Physics. So it was quite a good opportunity for, for me to go. I, I learned a lot and I got exposed further. And the picture on the far, uh, the bottom right, I, I couldn't, I was at a conference in Cuba, but I couldn't find like a picture that I took during my talk. I was actually presenting um, on behalf of Atlas, uh, my PhD uh, research work. So yeah, um, these are some of the uh, opportunities that I've had um, along my journey. Okay, so um, I forgot to mention at the beginning that I'm going to stop a few times to take some questions. And uh, But if you do have pressing questions in between, you can just stop me at any point. So are there any questions um, right now? On my background. Okay, so none, I guess, so I'll continue. Um, I'm going to just reiterate, um, I'm sure you've heard many times what particle physics is, but I'll, I'll just um, mention like in a nutshell, the goal of particle physics uh, is to understand what our universe is made up of at the most fundamental level. So that's why what we try to see go in inside the atoms all the way to bottom to find out what are we really made up of. And um, going to slide eight, um, obviously, you know, there are th theoretical physicists and experimental particle physicists. And as experimental particle physicists, um, what we do um, could be depicted by this cartoon that I show here on slide eight. We get a part of our universe and then we smash it until we get to the smallest uh, unbreak unbreakable piece. So it's like opening a Russian door, you know, there's so many in it. So you keep opening until you get to, to the last piece. So for us to do this, um, we, we just can't like do it by hand. We need, of course, um, really high energy. So we have dedicated machines for that, which we call particle uh, accelerators, which brings me to slide nine, the Large Hadron Collider, which I show in this picture. This is the largest particle accelerator um, that we have right now in, in the world. And it goes, um, it's located 100 meters underground at the border between France and Switzerland, um, Switzerland on the side of Geneva. And it's very large, um, as you can imagine, it spans uh, in circumference, it's about 27 kilometers. And what we do here is we strip protons uh, from hydrogen atoms, and then we, um, accelerate the protons. So we, we make them go around, uh, around this ring in bunches. So uh, bunches going in opposite directions. So one bunch of the protons goes counterclockwise and the other one goes uh, clockwise. And um, at various points uh, along this ring, um, we give them a push to, you know, to accelerate them. And so they keep gaining um, energy. And then we also have uh, magnets around the ring to just keep them um, moving along the secular path and then just to keep them focused. So once they have gained sufficient energy, we then collide them at four dedicated points. Uh, these are the four main points. There are smaller uh, other points. Uh, but the four main points um, have what I can say giant um, they're like giant cameras, high resolution cameras, we call them uh, particle detectors. And these kind of take a, a snapshot of what happens um, when a collision has happened. So 
we have a CMS, a compact muon solenoid, and then we have LHCb, and then we have ALICE, and then ATLAS, uh, which uh, Ketebi and I are working on and which I'll, I'll be telling you about uh, on the next slide. So this is also 100 meters underground, a very large um, particle detector. It's uh, 25 meters high and about 44 meters um, in length. And it's um, layered in, it's got different layers in an onion-like fashion. And each, each layer um, is specialized to to you know, to help us detect uh, a particular kind of particle. So on the next slide, I'm going to just take a, a slice of this detector uh, from the center outwards to just um, try and show you what these layers are and um, show you how they detect uh, some of the particles that you may be familiar with. Okay, so this is it. Uh, from the bottom, you see this small circle um, here, this is where the collision happens. And then the debris, the different things that come out uh, of this collision, they go outward um, into the various parts of the detector. So from the collision point, we have um, our tracking detector, which detects, of course, charged particles and measures the, their charge and momentum. And then we have uh, from there the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is specialized to detect particles that interact through the electromagnetic force. Then from there we have the hadronic calorimeter, which is also specialized to detect particles that interact via the strong force. Then we have the muon spectrometer, which is dedicated to detect uh, some type of particles that we call muons. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to show you um, later all these particles. So I'm going to give an example um, of an electron that you may be familiar with very well. So an electron is a, it's a charged particle. So it does leave a track in our tracking detector and then because it interacts heavily uh, electromagnetically, it um, deposits all of its energy in the electromagnetic um, calorimeter. And then, so this is how we are able to, to detect it. And then we have, uh, for example, a photon, which is not charged. It does not leave a track um, in, the, in our tracking detector, but it interacts electromagnetically and deposits most of its energy here in the electromagnetic calorimeter. So this is also how we are able to distinguish uh, between two different particles. So no track, track. Um, okay, so by carrying out, you know, such experiments uh, as we do um, in ATLAS, experimental particle physicists have been able to observe um, this full set of fundamental particles, which we know right now to the best of our knowledge as the fundamental particles that we have uh, in our universe. These have been predicted in a theoretical model called the standard model, which you may have heard of. And um, yeah, I'll just try to go through some, some of these. Um, so we, we, you can see here um, that there are three generations. Um, of matter, so these matter particles are called fermions, and there are two types of them: there are quarks, and then there are leptons. And the first generation here is what our everyday life um, is made up of. So you all, you know already the electrons; um, these are leptons, and you know the maybe the electron neutrino. And then here we have the quarks. So for example, in a proton, you have two up quarks and a down quark. Then you have all, all, all these other in the second and third generation. So these are, um, so the second generation is much heavier than the first generation and the third is much heavier than the second, so on. So the, the particles shown in orange here are what we call uh, gauge bosons. These are force carriers. So they mediate, they mediate uh, interactions among the, the, the matter particles. So at the top, you have the gluon, which mediates um, the strong force. Then you have the photon, which mediates um, 
the electromagnetic force, then you have the W and Z bosons, which together mediates the, the weak force. So, um, and also the Higgs boson, of course, gives mass uh, to all the, the, the massive particles that we have within this model. So because uh, it's important um, for my talk uh, that I mentioned that um, a few seconds after the Big Bang, the, the electromagnetic force and the weak force were seen as one force uh, called the electroweak force. Um, but as the universe expanded and cooled down, um, we see that these now exist as two separate um, forces or interactions. And within the standard model, this is explained by the introduction of the Higgs boson. So you can see here, um, so the, the numbers that are shown at the top uh, of each particle is the mass. So you can see the photon is massless, whereas the Z and the W bosons are massive. So the Higgs actually interacts with these uh, weak force mediators, but does not interact with the photon. So it leaves the photon massless and then gives mass um, to these two. Okay, so, and uh, my PhD work um, was focused on, on, on the W boson. You see it's, uh, it's charged compared to the, 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 the Z boson is, not, is neutral. Um, and we, these usually come in uh, pairs, vaguely I would say that. So you have maybe um, opposite charge assigned uh, w, w bosons. And what I'll be talking about is um, the observation of uh, same charge W bosons. Okay, so just to mention that, you know, these, um, particles that, that I show on, on slide 12, um, they have a lot of processes among them that have been predicted by the standard model. And the ATLAS physics program tries to cover um, many of these as I show now on, on slide 13. So these are several processes um, predicted by the standard model. And I just want to point out uh, on the right, the, the arrow that I show here, the scattering of two uh, same charge W bosons, which I'll be talking about uh, in my talk. You can see, so um, on the y-axis of the plot, you see the, the cross sections of, of these um, processes, which is like the probability um, of them occurring. And you can see for this same charge W bosons, the it, the cross-section is quite rare compared to even, for example, the Higgs to, to two photons, which you may have heard of um, in the media or, or, or in many uh, different talks. So it's quite a very rare process. Okay, so now um, coming to the data, are there any questions, uh, by the way, uh, just in case? Okay, um, so the, the so here I just show again the the atlas detector, and on the right I show the the data that has been recorded by atlas uh, during run two of the LHC. Uh, so you may know that um, the LHC started running sometime in. Uh, I think 2009, 2010, and then it ran until 2012, the end of 2012, before it, it shut down um, for, for some upgrade and maintenance. That era between 2009 to 2012 was called the LHC run one. And then when it reopened in 2015, the period between 2015 and 2018, that uh, we called the LHC run two. And so Right now it's actually uh, in shutdown because we, we are um, upgrading. So the data that we used for, for this study that I'm going to talk about uh, for my PhD work was obtained between 2015 and 2018. But actually what we just used um, was a fraction of this data. So it was only the data that we collected from 
2015 to 2016, um, it only amounted to 36.1 inverse femtoburns out of uh, around 139 inverse femtoburns, which is good for physics. So maybe just to explain this plot a bit, you see uh, in green, this is how much luminosity the LHC delivered to Atlas. And then in yellow, this is like how much Atlas recorded. And then in blue, this is how much um, you know, uh, luminosity was good for physics. So um, I can say that this is a time when the detector, like our the parts of our detector were working um, really well. So for those in the field, you know about the, the good runs list uh, and so on. Okay. So now I go into um, the study that I did for my PhD research. So we were looking for this scattering of two SEM-charged W bosons, which as I mentioned, is a very rare process within the standard model. And one of the motivations uh, for looking for, for such a rare particle is because we can further validate the standard model. And then the other thing is that we were looking for it. It's a, it's a vector boson scattering process. And, and I'll explain, um, this is the, the Feynman diagram that I show at the bottom shows the vector boson scattering uh, of this process. And this is important um, because in the abs absence of the, the Higgs boson, unitarity would be violated at high uh, center of mass energies. Okay, so this uh, looking into a process like this one, uh, would provide a unique test of the electroweak sector that I just mentioned uh, a few slides ago. So in the standard model, we think, okay, um, the electroweak symmetry breaking, um, you know, so the separation between electromagnetism and the weak interactions was caused by the introduction of the Higgs, but maybe it could be something else. So by looking into this process, we could find out. So that's why it's important. So just to explain the Feynman diagram that I show here. So you have two, the, the P there uh, represents protons. So you have uh, two um, incoming like bunches of protons, one going that way and that way. And then um, one of the quarks within the protons and the other the quark from the other proton exchange uh, a W boson. Okay, each exchange a W, and then they scatter off each other, um, the two W bosons. And then further, I don't show here, each of the W bosons decay to um, a lepton and uh, a neutrino. Okay, so these quarks, we call them jets, uh, just to know for, for the slide that is coming up. So this is how um, theoretically it kind of looks like. And then experimentally, what we do when, when we are looking for a process like this one is we look for two same charge leptons in our detector because of course the W, as I said, uh, decays to a lepton neutrino pair. So you won't see it. What you will see are its final state particles, which are the leptons. So the leptons here are in this diagram uh, at the bottom are shown in blue and in green. Uh, respectively. And then you have the neutrinos here shown uh, in dashed lines. And to detect the neutrinos to or to measure them, we use what we call missing transverse energy. And this is because the neutrinos escape our, detect, uh, our detector undetected. So they go all through our detector without leave, leaving a track, without depositing any energy, nothing. So we use missing transverse energy. And then we have um, the, the jets um, over here, which are the quarks uh, that I showed you. Okay, so we need to collect um, events such as this, this, these ones for us to study. So in our detector, I show you a, a real life event from our data uh, where you see, uh, so I'll give like the, this is a longitudinal view and that small circle around here is a transverse view. So you have two muons, these, these are muons which are um, going 
all the way out into the muon spectrometer. And then you have the neutrinos, which are the dashed line there. And then you have these um, bluish cyan cones, uh, which are the jets. So this is a real event uh, from, from our data. Okay, so the other thing that we need to look into um, when we are analyzing a date, our data is to also estimate processes that could you know, mimic our signal. So we, go, we call these backgrounds and um, I'm not going to uh, give the details of how we determine all of them, but um, I'll give one example. But first, so here I show four categories um, of these backgrounds. So we have what we call the non prompt background. This comes from processes such as uh, two, two top pairs, so a top and an anti-top W plus jets processes or single top processes. So in the case of the top processes, um, the top go, uh, decays to a W and a B jet. So in our signal, we can end up picking uh, one lepton from the W and then we pick another lepton from the decay of a B jet. So how we estimated this uh, was using a data-driven technique, which I, I won't go into explaining, um, it's out of the scope uh, of this talk. And then we have the, what we called uh, the prompt background, which comes from processes such as um, WZ scattering, ZZ, and then um, VVV, which is uh, V in this case, it's a vector, a vector boson. So you could have uh, three, three vector bosons. So either a, a W, WW, or a ZZZ, or, or a mixture of the two. And so how this can end up uh, being picked up uh, as our signal is that we can pick two same charge leptons. Um, for example, in the WZ case, maybe we can pick two um, same charge leptons from a Z. So a Z uh, decays to, to two leptons. Um, and then we pick them up and then we miss um, the lepton that comes from, from the W. So these two leptons end up in our signal. So for the WZ boson, um, WZ background, we estimated it using a data-driven technique and then uh, the other um, processes we estimated just purely from um, Monte Carlo simulations. Then there's another background that we classified as uh, E gamma conversions. The gamma there uh, represents a photon. So this um, could come from processes like the opposite sign, uh, WW scatter. And remember, we're, we're looking into same sign. And then also V gamma uh, processes, so Z gamma or, or W gamma processes. So in this case, um, you can find that maybe um, because of our reconstruction techniques, the way we, that we use to, to identify these particles, we end up assigning um, a wrong charge to, to one of the leptons that are coming from these, or because um, of brain strahlung, which so I'm going to explain this uh, on the next slide, you end up having a photon being misidentified as an electron. So for the case where we could assign a wrong charge uh, to one of the leptons, we estimated this background using a data-driven technique. And then for the V gamma background, which I'm going to explain soon, we estimated using both uh, data and Monte Carlo simulations. Then the final uh, category of our backgrounds is the QCD, same charge uh, WW scattering process. So maybe I, uh, I didn't mention that what we're looking for um, in our scattering process is one that is um, coming is il il produced electroweakly. So um, the QCD one, we we take it um, as a as a background. So QCD is just quantum chromodynamics. So vaguely, I would say um, something in, in involving uh, gluons. Okay. So on the next slide, I show uh, how we 
estimate the background uh, coming from photon conversions in the V gamma uh, processes. So here I show um, this uh, Feynman diagram over here, um, a Z gamma process. So where you have a Z going, uh, decaying to two muons, a, mu, a mu minus and a mu plus, and then one of the photons, uh, one of the muons, sorry, radiates a photon, and then it decays to an electron uh, positron pair. Okay, so a positively charged electron called a positron. So um, how we estimate how it can, um, how much of this background we can end up having uh, in our detector is that we try and define a phase space where we could have um, most of these um, Z gamma uh, events. So our selection um, in this phase space, we select uh, three, um, two muons and one of the electrons, either of them. And then, so I have the, I haven't shown the full event selection cuts that we put on our, on the objects that we select in the signal region. But here, this ET miss represents missing transverse energy. And in our signal region, we want it to be large. So we made, we made it, um, we optimized it to be greater than 30 uh, GeV. And in this case, in our uh, phase space for, for the Z gamma um, background, we make it to be less than 30 GeV so that we can eliminate um, some of the uh, processes in order to get something that is pure uh, in Z gamma. And then because we want to kind of um, select Z gamma events, of course, we know that the, the Z boson is around 90 GeV. So when we select these three uh, leptons, the, the two muons and the electron, we know, of course, we, we assume that the electron came from a, a photon, which came from a muon. So when we reconstruct the environment mass um, of these three uh, objects, we expect it to be around the Z mass. So that's why we put the bounds uh, to be between 75 and 100 GeV. Okay, so once we have defined our phase space and we have um, our Z gamma, of course, we also add in, in this phase space, we put in or um, the other backgrounds that, that we had like in the signal region. Then we, we get a scale factor uh, by comparing all these um, processes, uh, including Z gamma to the date to real data. So we subtract data, uh, the, all the other processes from data, and we divide that by um, the Z gamma uh, events to obtain this scale factor. Then we go back into our signal region and we scale like any V gamma events that we have by this scale factor. And the uncertainty that we get uh, on this scale factor, we will add it um, as a systematic uncertainty um, when we determine the significance uh, and the cross section, as you see um, in the next slide. Okay, so I'm almost uh, at the end of my talk, um, but this is another um, topic actually that was given during the, the, the lecture series, how we determine the statistical significance. So I'm, I'm going to point, point out a few things, but it, it could be uh, a topic on its own. So to do this, um, we used a maximum likelihood fit in four bins of uh, the digit invariant mass, which I call MJJ um, here. So, and the plot on the right here is the MJJ um, distribution in our signal region. So after we have made all our selections, this is how the distribution looks like. And you can see all the uh, backgrounds that we estimated. Um, you can check the legend here. And then the yellow is this, this is our estimation of, of what the signal would be. So besides estimating how much backgrounds we could have, we also need to estimate how much signal um, we could have 
So this is it, and you can see that it reasonably agrees well um, with the data points which are shown in black here, except for this outlier, which I, I don't even remember exactly what um, we had concluded on this one. But yeah, so um, in order to uh, begin with our significance extraction, we first build a likelihood function in each bin um, of the MJJ distribution, which I have simplified uh, very much um, here at, in this equation at the bottom. So this is uh, the probability of observing a particular number of data events uh, in each bin um, of MJJ. So the mu here is what we call um, our parameter of interest which is our signal strength. And the theta here represents Muse's parameters, which parameterize our systematic uncertainty. So our systematic uncertainties go in there. And uh, NI ops is the number of observed events um, that we expect in each bin. And the, the uh, NI expected are the number of signal events that we would expect and it's um, given in this equation um, over here at the top. Okay, so once we have built um, our likelihood uh, function, then we use um, a test statistic called, called the profile likelihood ratio, which is shown here, which is the ratio of the conditional um, maximum likelihood to the unconditional uh, maximum likelihood. So here um, in the conditional case, because we want to compare um, our signal to like what we see um, to a case where if we only had background events. So this is why we use um, mu equal to zero. Um, this represents having no signal. So there's no signal at all, it's all background. And theta double hat, these are the systematic uncertainties on nuisance parameters uh, that would maximize our likelihood for a given for this given um, mu value of zero. And so once we have our test statistic to quantify how compatible um, observed and expected data are, we use what we call the p-value. And this I, I don't show here, it's just a, a probability distribution of this test statistic. And as I said, um, we want to see um, if we only had background uh, and no signal, would we see a result like this? So this quantifies like um, the probability of observing a, a, a result as extreme as this test, uh, test statistic if we only had background, okay? And in particle physics, for us to um, establish a discovery we use um, this threshold called phi, uh, the five sigma significance. So this corresponds to a p-value of um, 2.7 by 10 to the minus seven. So at least it should be that, yeah. So for our study, um, we got uh, a p-value corresponding to a significance of 6.9 sigma. So uh, clearly this is an observation. Okay. So for the, then we have to measure um, the cross section. And for this, this as well could be a, a topic for another day, uh, which I'm not even an expert in yet. Um, but vaguely, I, I can say that how we do it, this is a very, um, simplified, but we use it, use it, we determine it using this relationship here uh, of the number um, of signal events and the luminosity. Um, and this sigma is a cross section. Uh, it's different from the one I showed on the previous slide. So what we got um, as a cross section is shown here as 2.91. Um, with some statistical and systematic uh, uncertainties. So you can see here that the statistical uncertainties are quite large, um, which means this uh, measurement was limited by statistics. As you can imagine, we just used a small uh, fraction of the 
total uh, luminosity, integrated luminosity that, that was available between 2015 and 2018. And maybe just to explain the, the plot that I show here, uh, shows the cross sections. So the cross section that we measured um, is shown here uh, at the bottom. So to estimate our signal process, we used uh, a Monte Carlo generator called Sherpa. So this is what it corresponds to. And then we were doing some cross checks with another uh, generator called Palheg. Um, but yeah, this was just for, for a cross check and it lacked a few things so we could not use it. And then we have uh, what we see in, in data um, over here. Okay, so this brings me to my concluding slide. Um, I think that went pretty quickly. So I hope I have shown you that my journey as an experimental particle physicist started really at ASP 2010, because this is where I came to know about particle physics and at CERN. And um, over the years, I have worked um, um, most like all of my, um, postgraduate studies. I have worked on the ATLAS experiment uh, at CERN. And then I have also talked about um, my PhD research, which was on the scattering of two same charge W bosons, which we observed uh, with a significance of 6.9 sigma. And uh, we measured its cross section as 2.91 uh, femtobands. And then, uh, as I said earlier, we used only a small fraction of the total luminosity from between 2015 and 2018. So this analysis is actually being repeated on the full um, set uh, of data. So we expect more statistics and higher precision. Okay, so if anyone is interested in looking up um, results for from this study, um, the, the Atlas official results, you can check this link. I could share the slides later. So yeah, that's it. I just want to also mention that for, for the full uh, set of data that we're looking at, I'm also part uh, of this analysis during my postdoc. And then um, the other thing that I'm doing, as I mentioned right now, the LHC is in shutdown and we are upgrading most parts of our detector. So I'm also working uh, on the upgrade to the calorimeters um, that I showed you um, earlier. Okay, so that's it from my side. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thanks for this uh, nice presentation. Um, before we go to uh, questions and comments, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, some of uh, my colleagues who are here. Um, we have here uh, George Red Redlinger. Uh, he's uh, our colleague at BNL, also BNL staff uh, working on uh, particle physics. Uh, we also have uh, Diallo Boy, who is uh, another postdoc. Uh, Diallo will be talking later in March. Um, he's uh, also a postdoc uh, with Chirufia in our group. Uh, he was in uh, ASP 2012. And now uh, we also have here our group leader, Michael Begel. Um, so I'm not sure, Michael or uh, uh, George, if you guys, if you want to say something, uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Chalufa, for giving this very nice talk. It's a very nice overview of what's going on. and. I, I think that we've had a really found that the experience of deal, working with the African students has been quite exhilarating. Um, back before the pandemic, we had a large group of uh, alum come to the laboratory for a summer or more and work with us. And it was a very positive experience. And we look forward to getting back to that once the once the COVID restrictions have um, gone away. Thanks, Michael. George, you want to say something? Uh, 
Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I, uh, apart to say thanks for the nice talk, I, I joined the talk rather late because I had some connection troubles. Um, so thanks for the nice talk and I hope to be on time next time. I think maybe we need somebody to somewhere. mute. All right. Um, we have some uh, static. So uh, uh, people who are not talking, can you please mute? All right. Um, OK, so. Uh, Majub, do you could you mute please? Um, all right. So now we have a uh, we have some time for questions and answer. Uh, um, and then I I understand that uh, a number of uh, people connected are not uh, majoring in particle physics, but nevertheless, maybe you have. Uh, some questions or some comments uh, that you may want to ask. So let me just say that even if it's about my background, which I talked about um, at the beginning of my slides, even if you think it's personal, I'll, I'll be able to determine. Okay, there is a question on the chat saying that can someone who does not have background in particle physics attend summer school at CERN? Um, yes, I think so, because um, we get a lot of people that are coming just directly from undergrad. Um, some of them have not done um, particle physics. So yeah, um, I wouldn't be maybe one hundred percent sure, but I think it's um, yeah possible. So maybe what we could do is to send as well the, um, the information. But on the website of CERN, I think it's uh, also easy to find uh, how to apply for those uh, summer school. And there are yeah. a lot of, of different things. It's not only high energy physics. You need a lot of additional skill to build up uh, those big detectors, uh, as it was shown. I would say yes, of course. My background is not in high energy physics, for instance, so in particle accelerator, and I did uh, there as well some uh, some studies. Other questions or comments? Chirufia, could you go back to page six of your talk? Oh, okay, let me just see if I could. I know, I'm not, I don't remember if it's page six or not, but uh, one of the earlier. <clears throat> yeah, 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 that's that nice uh, Cuban uh, car that you have over there. <laughs> yeah. Did you bring that back to Zambia or did you just <laughs> drive it while you were there? Uh, I, I, I wish uh, I could have brought it back. It's a car from the, I think 1954, because they have really old cars there. But no, um, I did not even drive it. <laughs> All right, so that's just in parentheses. But, uh, but I did ride in it. I, I did ride in it. OK. Other questions or other comments? Uh, Sulufia, is, is your 6.9 uh, sigma is uh, local significance, I guess, right? Yes. So do you have the global one or you did not calculate it? Uh, I would need to check. I, I don't remember. Yeah, I didn't. Mm, I do not remember. I would need to check. Um, anybody other questions? Um, there are many questions in the chat. Oh, yeah. many questions in the chat. So let me just uh, go back there. So. Yes, uh, 
So for life science, I answered to that one. Oh, I will answer Coyote. So I know that uh, I still own you those different links. Huh? So this is a bit different from high energy physics, but I will take care of that, huh, Kateri. All right. Thanks, Christine. So there is a question from uh, from Raymond. Raymond was one of Raymond. You are one of the people who came to BNL in 2019, right? I think this is Raymond Yogo. Yes. Okay, very good. So Raymond. Yeah, that's to... Raymond Yogo. How are you doing? Um, he wants I'm doing to know fine. what have been your postdoc experience so far, Chidufia. <laughs> So let me see. <laughs> I haven't even thought about that. <laughs> I've been, so let's see, this past year was difficult. So my first postdoc was with the University of Cape Town. It was uh, interesting to work with the, the students, um, but this was during the pandemic. I, uh, like we were all working remotely, well, even now, of course. And um, this experience right now, um, I'm really enjoying what I'm working on, especially with the, the upgrade work. So it's it's been such a good experience so far. Um, finding um, a new group, BNL is such a, an amazing team. Um, they have a lot of expertise, so um, like really wide, broad range of expertise. So like whenever I need something, there's always something, somebody in the group um, that, that I could ask. So compared also to where I'm coming from, like, for example, at UCT, we had a very uh, small group. And yeah, what else can I say? I'm still experiencing, I'm still settling down in, in um, Switzerland again. So yeah, otherwise it's uh, great so far. Could Sorry you, for you, that answers. Could you clarify a little bit? So you are, you are a postdoc at BNL, but, uh, but uh, you are you are still uh, at Sam. Could you clarify that a bit? Yeah, so I'm a postdoc at BNL, of course, which is um, in in New York, in the United States, uh, but I'm based uh, at CERN because um, all the work that I'm doing right now on this postdoc um, needs my presence uh, here. For example, for, for the upgrade work, uh, I need to be here um, at CERN um, to continue with that work. So... Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a question from Matt. Matt Cornell, you want to ask your question? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, Chlifa. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm new to particle physics at, at CERN. I just had a question about the background. Uh, how do you determine what processes might lead to a background signal or a signal that's mimicking the event you're looking for? Yeah, um, good question, how? So, I mean, uh, let me just try to go to that slide again. Okay, so, we get, so when, when we have um, a collision in our detector, we get like all sorts of things going on, all sorts of processes um, happening. And um, they have, they, so some of them, so I told you we have a final state of um, two leptons, two neutrinos and two forward jets. So we have to make, um, so vaguely, I would say we have to make a collection of any such processes that could have uh, a, a final state similar to the one that, that we are looking for. Okay, and, and in some cases, we look at studies that have been done um, also before, um, because th maybe they studied this extensively and, extensively and they determined um, which 
backgrounds would be like significant in the Cigna region. So because also we, we, we looked at this, but there could be many others, but they are just negligible um, uh, in our Cigna region. So yeah. So yeah, um, Matthew Cornell is uh, just uh, about to start uh, um, his uh, PhD journey at the University of Johannesburg. So uh, Matthew, uh, yeah, thank you. And, and welcome to the club. Uh, um, thank you, that, that pretty much perfectly answered my question as well, thank you. <clears throat> other, other questions, or other, other comments? Hi, Katari, this is George. Yes, please go ahead. George, yes. Uh, I have to say I'm biased. I, I was in the same class with Chichi at uh, University of Zambia. <laughs> nice talk, Chichi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to, to, to find out something um, about the detection system. What's the trigger condition? Or do you just record all the data? Because no, it seems the data not. is a lot. No, of course. I mean, you can imagine that. Um, we get so like millions of collisions uh, per second. We can't, we can't possibly store everything that's coming from that. So we have a trigger system. Um, so we have uh, like different levels of triggering. We have a, a hardware based trigger and a software uh, based trigger, which, um, yeah, I, I don't have it even in my backup, but if you're interested, I can talk to you after. But yeah, so this trigger system carefully selects events that look uh, interesting. So for example, like sometimes we, we could get um, noisy electrons, for example, which have very low PT. So we have a threshold on, on what PT um, we put so that we don't pick up on these uh, very noisy um, electrons. So yeah, the short answer is we do have a, a trigger system. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Thank you. Sophia. Thank you. One last question or comment. Okay, um, Chirufia, thanks for, 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 for this for this talk. It's, uh, Really nice to to hear of uh, of your journey, and uh, all the all the best to you uh, in your in your postdoctoral experience and and uh, uh, the role model that you are playing for the younger people uh, um, in Africa and 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 uh, I really congratulate congratulate you on this and all the best. Um, next week. We will uh, hear about medical physics from uh, Justina, another one of our alumni who has uh, finished her PhD. So um, we look forward to hear Justina talk to us next week. Uh, Christine, you want to say anything before we finish? So just to resonate as well with what you're saying. So it's uh, it's wonderful to see the evolution and all the, the good work that you have uh, presented to see that that's, uh, as a role model, exactly. I think it's a, it's a good definition as well. So it's uh, very interesting as well from your background. I mean, we know that it's, we were trying really to emphasize how as well developing country and developed country have the, the same goal. And in this case with high energy physics, it's a perfect uh, way to show that you can do it uh, if you want it, like what you did. So it's wonderful uh, parcours that you did. And as well, the B with the BNL, I think it's also important Hilary, to show that uh, in your labs has been doing a, a large effort as well to welcome students who have such a capacity and it's really, really recommendable. So if only there would be more laboratory as well that could uh, support such type of effort. But even if it's difficult for each of you potentially as well to find some places, but I think what is important is to, to go for it and to, to study hard. And postdoc will come certainly as, uh, as it goes. And at least uh, the, this is the way which is important, not only the goal. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Christine. Oh, Christine, thank you very much. So before we leave, uh, the people who can, uh, who uh, who want to, 
you can uh, show your face so that we can take a screenshot. Um, we will also uh, put this on the on the agenda page. Um, Chirufia, people have asked for your talk, so if you can send me the PDF at some point to upload it to the agenda page, or you can upload it yourself also. We have a recording of this session that also will be uploaded to the agenda page and Christine will convert it to a YouTube uh, piece. Right, Christine? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so full screen, except that I'm only, no, let me see what do I mean. For some reason, Christine, I'm only seeing you. Uh, if you know. go to gallery, you select the gallery mode. I, I have it otherwise, if you want. Okay, uh, gallery view, yeah, it's fine. I have it now. What? Okay, good. All right, just... so I'm just going to take a screenshot, yeah, so that uh, we can uh, remember this uh, nice section. Um, all right, so let me see. That is fine. And uh, um, thanks everybody for coming and, and uh, for participating. Justina, we look forward to your talk next week. Yeah? All right, so um, I'm going to end the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao. Bye bye.